it's my great pleasure to interview Professor Oaks uh, this evening. I read The Scorpion Sting uh, with the idea that I would find all kinds of flaws with it because we often disagree about the Civil War. And I have to say, I couldn't find very many things that I disagreed with, but there are a few, and we're going to talk about those <laughs> this evening. Uh, the, the thing I think I disliked about the book was it's now requiring me to rethink everything I ever thought I knew about the Civil War. <laughs> so but so uh, to start, uh, Professor Oates, if you could give us an overview of the scorpion sting and please relate it to your book of last year, uh, Freedom National. It's a continuation of a project that began uh, with the previous book, which is the one, uh, the one Louise mentioned uh, on Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. That book prompted me to think anew about the process by which slavery was destroyed during the Civil War and uh, ended up producing the book you mentioned, Freedom National, last year. And this book is part of the continuing rethinking of that process of slavery's destruction. Uh, the more I continue to think about it, the more I, I have to revise my own previous thinking. So Freedom National revised certain things that were in the Lincoln Douglas book, and this book already revises some things that were in the Freedom National book. Uh, what they're all trying to do, what they all seem to be doing, uh, is complicating the usual simple narratives of how slavery was destroyed. There are several of them out there. The most familiar one is, I suppose, Lincoln freed all the slaves with the stroke of his pen by signing the Emancipation Proclamation. The more, uh, <clears throat> the more elaborate version of that would say that uh, Lincoln understood from the time he was a young man that it was his destiny to free the slaves, and as a, but uh, knew that he had to wait until the American people came up to his advanced thinking about it. Um, another one that's become uh, surprisingly popular recently is that slavery was abolished during the Civil War inadvertently, that it was the accidental byproduct of war that nobody ever intended it to happen. Uh, it's, it's outlandish, but it's there. Um, and the most popular one among historians and the one that most influenced me when I was a younger historian is what I now call the, the, the Skinner box theory of emancipation. It's defined, emancipation can be understood as a, 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 through the principles of behavioral psychology as a simple stimulus response argument, that slaves run to union lines, when uh, that's the stimulus. When enough of them run to union lines, the stimulus becomes overwhelming, and Lincoln is forced to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. Mm -hmm. What I've been saying especially in the last book and this book, is that uh, those tend to be ahistorical. They don't appreciate the impact, for example, especially of the anti-slavery movement in formulating uh, an anti-slavery agenda that was politically viable and constitutionally reasonable to Americans who believed uh, almost all of Americans who believed that the Constitution did not allow the federal government to go into the South and abolish slavery in a state where it already existed. That being the case, how can you have a national anti-slavery politics? Beginning in the 1830s, abolitionists begin to think about this problem and formulate a series of policies that they believe will surround the South with what they call a cordon of freedom, uh, uh, they will uh, suppress slavery on the high seas. They will refuse uh, enforcement there of the fugitive slave clause in the North. They will return all enforcement to the states themselves so that the northern states will be free states, truly free states. They will abolish slavery in Washington, D.C. They will ban slavery from the territories. They won't allow any new slave states to come into the Union. They will support, they will not support slaveholders whose slaves rebel on the high seas mm -hmm. uh, and the like. And in all these ways, they believe they could surround the slave states with what they called a cordon of freedom until, in the popular metaphor of the day, slavery, like a scorpion surrounded by fire, would ultimately sting itself to death. That is, 
they would restart the process of state-by-state -state abolition that ended in 1804 when New Jersey abolished slavery. At the time, folks thought that that process would continue. It had, it, it, it had been abolished state-by-state-by-state by state by state during the, uh, in, in the immediate aftermath of the revolution. And after New Jersey did it in 1804, people naturally assumed the next state will be Delaware and Maryland and the like, and, but it didn't. And by the time you get to 1860, it's been 55, 60 years since any state abolished slavery. And the, the point of the Scorpion Sting was to restart that process. The agenda was to restart that process. And, and so that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to say you can't understand what, what goes on during the Civil War unless you understand the project that Abraham Lincoln and the Republicans came into the war intending to do, what he meant when he said that he wanted to put slavery on a course of ultimate extinction. Mm -hmm. Now, what we do know is that in the first months of the war, Lincoln is attempting to convince the border states to emancipate through state action. Right. And even in the midst of war, that doesn't, I know you say that, you know, five states do that, but Kentucky, for instance, does not. Right. Delaware does not, That's right. even though you have very few enslaved people in Delaware. That's right. And so how likely, and I know this is counterfactual, but I'm still gonna ask it anyway. How likely would it have been that slavery would have been extinguished that way, given that there are these states who absolutely are not willing to go in that direction? Right. No, I don't, uh, I don't know. Nobody knows, because it's, you know, if, if things had been different, things would have been different. Mm -hmm. um, but the truth is that uh, I don't think any, any interpretation of slavery's demise works without the war. The war changes everything. The war makes things possible, right? I don't think the Emancipation Proclamation is conceivable without a war, because it's a war measure. I don't think slavery would have died on its own without a war. I don't believe that interpretation. I don't think the scorpion sting would have worked without a war. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, wars don't automatically lead to slavery's abolition. They never did in the past, and there's no reason to think that it would have during the Civil War had it not been for the fact that Republicans began implementing these two very different policies right from the start of the war. The one that we're familiar with, military emancipation, slaves run to Union lines and the Union will emancipate them. That's what armies have always done during wars. It's happened in the American Revolution, happened in the War of 1812, happened during the Seminole War. And, and the Union started doing that very early during the, the Civil War by the summer of 1861. It's emancipating slaves coming into Union lines. But it's not universal emancipation. Not universal. It's emancipation here and there. That's right. Emancipation, military emancipation, as it is initially implemented, is mm -hmm. more like the military emancipation from the revolution, mm -hmm. from the War of 1812. They're following the precedents. But you need to know that that's what they're doing. You can't just assume, again, that the history of emancipation starts in 1861. It doesn't start in 1861. You don't, if you don't know the history, if you don't know how military emancipation has worked in the past, in, in the American past, and Americans were familiar with it. Joshua Giddings, the great anti-slavery congressman from Ohio, published a book on the Seminole War in 1857 detailing the process by which uh, Union American forces in Florida emancipated slaves in the late 1830s during the Seminole War and explained why military emancipation works that way. Mm -hmm. They know what military emancipation is going into the war. So they have certain expectations that slaves will run to Union lines, they respond initially in ways that are familiar to the history of military emancipation in previous American wars. They use the language and the justifications for military emancipation that you hear uh, military officers using during the Seminole War. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, the laws of war allow this, they overrule state laws and, and, and such. And it's helpful to know that because if you don't know the precedents and you don't know what happened prior, if you don't know the history, you won't even recognize what's going on. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things I'm trying to do here is reconstruct the prehistory, the assumptions about emancipation going into the war. And, and that, as I say, uh, is, uh, therefore you, you can see then why in the spring of 1862, when the Second Confiscation Act radically shifts 
military emancipation